Hello everyone, welcome to Unity's Creator Spotlight. This is a really special one. It's the first time we're streaming live uh, in the evening time for most people in the uh, East Coast. Uh, so we usually do this at noon on Wednesdays. We're doing a slightly different time today because we have special guests with us today. We have our first international team from Shanghai, China. So I'm really excited to bring these guests on uh, for anybody, for for anyone who it's their first time watching the Creator Spotlight. It's a show where we get a rare in-engine look at uh, made with Unity developers games. So we get to look in editor and break down their games, looking at their how they build the tools they're really proud of making. Uh, in this particular case, we are with team Miaozi uh, looking at Cygnus Enterprises, uh, which uh, and in this game, we're going to be looking at their design of it. We're going to be looking at their data driven approach to building the game. Uh, we're going to actually show gameplay footage of the game live. We're going to look at their level generation tools and uh, their AI systems. So, and we're going to get a very exclusive look at some of their upcoming content that's coming up for the game. So we have some great stuff in store for you today. I'm going to let the developers uh, introduce the game a little more. But before that, I want to cut to the trailer of the game before we introduce those developers. So let's uh, cut to that trailer. Welcome to Cygnus Enterprises, Contractor. We are the galaxy's leading space exploration mega corporation. You have been tasked to restore our facilities on Nitalis to a productive and profitable state. Now, let's get to work. Remember, the company is here to support you. Just in case things go wrong. Got it. Let's go. But enough about you. Let's talk about me. I'll make sure my staff pays their fair share to use your facilities. Opulence comes at a price after all. Any future visitors that stay at one of these doors will net you some well-deserved credits too. Time to test out the new upgrades. If you are hearing this, and we've failed, please finish what we started. This is bigger than any of us could have imagined. And everyone is here. Thanks for joining me, guys. Hello. <laughs> Super, hello. Hello, hello. hello. Super early in the morning for you. How, how early is it right now? It's 9-11. 9-11, okay, I appreciate you joining so early in the morning. This is great. The nine, it's, it's 9 a.m. for them, Shanghai time. Um, uh, so I, I just introduced the studio name, and we were talking about this while the trailer was playing in the, behind the scenes. The name of the studio, I saw somebody in the chat call it out, Miaozi, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing it correctly, but it has a, an interesting meaning, meaning that so, that's related to how the word actually sounds. Can you explain that? <laughs> yes, so actually Miaozi, it's a combination of two things. One is meow from cat. Actually, okay. that's that's uh, that's how cat would be called in Chinese for yeah. Chinese characters. And zi actually stands for baozi or jiaozi, which are basically two foods that you eat a lot here in China that okay. we all liked. Um, it's a typical thing that foreigners would love from the get go. So we just combined those two words and we made a a, a studio name for us. I mean, it sounds like a real word, but. Uh... <laughs> I guess you guys made it up, which is great. Uh, so just for everybody who doesn't know, I would love to do a quick round of introductions of everyone who's joining us here, starting to my right, uh, Brian. Hello, I'm Brian Cox. I'm the lead programmer in Team Yauza for Cygnus Enterprise. Thanks for joining us. Uh, and uh, Oscar. 
Uh, hello everyone, my name is Oscar. I'm the product manager for Cygnus Enterprises. It's a pleasure to have you, Oscar. So, so happy you could join. Uh, and Louis. Hello everyone, I'm Louis. Uh, I'm one of the AI programmer in Team Yeltsin. Okay, awesome. Uh, I would love to get a quick, uh, before we jump into the game itself, maybe you can give us uh, like a brief history of the studio, Meata, of the studio Meata, and how you all came together. Uh, what brought you to Shanghai, and just yeah, a brief like introduction. What if, if any games you've worked on in the past, if any? Yes, uh, if you guys want, I will start. Okay. So uh, it was it was back 2019, right? Yeah. And NetEase Games, our mother company, wanted to have a first party studio created in Shanghai hmm. with an international team to make international and uh, international games and to be able to appeal to global audiences. Hmm. So back in 2019, we started small and we started bringing people here from all over the world. And we got we got uh, young folks from everywhere. We have people from 12 different nationalities and we gathered around 50 people wow. at that time. So that and that was the, the birth of Team Yalza. Mm -hmm. Then in 2020, of course, uh, COVID hit, but we remained strong and we kept developing here in Shanghai. And now after a few a few years, we have our first game. OK, so when you got into the pandemic were you still how big was the team at that time so actually fortunately we have like let's say we started a little bit earlier in 2019 and we have time okay. to to get everyone here on board and pandemic hit on around february of 2020 more or less and mm -hmm. luckily at that time everyone was here so so yeah we we already had everyone in so we didn't expand after that okay. but we just had everyone we needed uh everyone was here so we had all the people already in shanghai settled down to to work in the game so that wasn't a big issue okay great so that was uh, like around 50 people or something or so yes yes more or less 50 okay. people and we have like people from everywhere we have like as brian here from belgium louis from france me from spain but we also have people from ireland uh korea we have people from uh, Russia, Ukraine, Italy. Um, wow, really UK. diverse team. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, that actually so. brings a bunch of questions to my mind. So, like, there's like a lot of things happening at the same time here. Your first time, maybe like living in Shanghai. It's also uh, a very diverse team of people who haven't met before working on your first game as a studio. It's a lot of like firsts. So, how did you yes. uh, deal with? That? Also, of course, pandemic on top of that. How did you manage all of this? So, luckily, Shanghai is a really international city that is mm -hmm. really welcoming to, to foreigners. So that was a really easy adaptation for us, right? Okay. It's indeed, it's true that pandemic could be a little challenging, but we adapted to work from home when it was needed and working from the office when we could. And luckily, the pandemic was uh, really, let's say, easy in China, it was quite well managed. So we most of the time, we were in office normally working. So, so that was... It wasn't a big of a deal uh, during that time. The pandemic was resolved pretty soon in China, let's say in 1.5 months. Mm -hmm. And then we spent, I'd say, all, the entirety of the two years just developing normally. Oh, so all in office together? Yes, yes, okay. exactly. I see, I see. And uh, the diversity of the team, did that? Did you feel this had an effect on, um, I'm assuming some of you have worked on uh, different game projects in the past, right? Is this one of the more diverse teams you've worked on since it's very, all like international? I guess that's a question for everyone. Maybe we could start with Brian. Uh, yeah, definitely. Well, normally game studios and game development teams, they're very international, but this case was extra special because you take a bunch of people from all over the world <laughs> yeah. and you put them in a country and in a place uh, where they've never been before and where the culture and the language is completely different. Yes. Um, and funnily enough, some people on the team uh, so before I was in Shanghai, I was working in the UK hmm. and uh, literally some people from previous studios where I worked, like Creative Assembly, they also joined this team and we didn't know about it. So we, we only met each other. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So you had no idea. You're just like walking to the office and you're like, wait a minute. Yes, exactly. I know you. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. To show how small the game development community really is. And for you, Oscar? Uh, so 
I would say that uh, the international culture, it's something that you create within the studio. So indeed, yeah. uh, you have to adapt to each other's uh, mindsets, which might be a little different. Yeah. But once you get together and you get going and you work, and we basically all speak the same language, yeah. English. Although, of course, working, you may hear different languages popping up in <laughs> yes. the studio. But but you just create your own culture within the studio. And, and that's the culture that we work on. So basically, everyone adapts a little bit to their to their partner, right? To the to their teammate, and then that 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 team Yautzu culture arises. Let's say. Interesting. Okay. And 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 Luis, uh, were you also working on projects before joining? Uh, uh, so? Yeah, actually, I never really worked in France. Me, so I directly went to abroad because uh, I did my studio abroad, my last year of studio abroad. So I, I got a job in South Korea. So I was kind of used okay. to work uh, at least in a foreign country. But yeah. yeah, this team is like super diverse. But I feel like uh, we all like memes and we still have like, we kind of have the same, you know, like reference, uh, gaming culture and stuff. So. Right, right. Because there's yeah. basically, there's like a, a global culture that has emerged with the internet and you're just able to just yeah. get off on the same foot right away. That's great. Um, I'm wondering like when it comes to developing like the game itself, uh, all those different backgrounds, when you're building a game with a specific story and a lore and uh, just a way of being, does that affect everyone bringing their own cultures into the game, or yeah, how, how do you find find that? So indeed, out? in terms in terms of mm -hmm. design and game vision, I would say that uh, different cultures may definitely shape the outcome of the game. And I'm going to put you an example, right? Yeah. Please. So if we go, if we started talking about Cygnus Enterprises, we uh, we wanted to, and I guess that this is somehow uh, due to our culture, mm -hmm. we wanted to create a futuristic game. But yeah. we wanted this game to be bright. We wanted this game to be positive, optimistic. So an a, optimistic look to what future has to bring, right? We've seen in recent years that uh, most of the games that we have are talking about the future are actually much grim, dark, and pessimistic. That's so very more, true. More or yeah. less are post-apocalyptic. And we wanted to do it differently, right? So we wanted yeah. to bring a future because we all grown up with, let's say, at least for us with like TV series such as Star Trek. Star Trek, if you think about it, the future that they presented, though challenging, was Hopeful. much more much more much more bright and, mm. and optimistic. So we wanted mm. to bring this. And I guess that our culture and also our age also influenced that on Cygnus Enterprise. Interesting. It's interesting you bring up the age as well. Well around 30s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. Um I, I like that different approach because for a time there, you're absolutely right. There was this this influx of just dark future, depressing, a post-apocalyptic. Everything is zombies. We're all gonna die. <laughs> and now, so you've taken this kind of different approach. Okay, so and Perfect. I think that's a good segue to talking about the game itself and like the, what sparked the, the idea. You you talked about the tone, but also but the gameplay itself. What sparked the idea of this sandbox building, looting, battling kind of gameplay? um and yeah how the game came about essentially yes so i talked about the the theme or the setting of the game which was the the futuristic uh bright uh, uh more or less or hopefully we try to keep ourselves like more on on hard sci-fi although of course at the end we we included a bit of of not that hard sci-fi stuff but then we wanted so we had the theme and we wanted to come up with a game loop that would be would be cool for that kind of theme and we settled but we wanted to be innovative right so we thought okay how can we innovate on that so we created we decided to mix two genres right uh we decided to mix top-down action rpg so like a top-down shooter with base building mm -hmm. right so a colony sim uh more sandbox more sandbox approach and we had to we wanted to mix both genres into the same game and that was our beat of innovation here right so you go onto these missions and these missions gives you resources and you fight enemies and then you bring those resources back to your base okay that you keep expanding growing and and transforming to give you more power to go to more difficult missions and then fight bigger enemies ch more challenging enemies more challenging bosses discover new environments gather some more loot Okay. and then bring that look back to the base and again repeat the process right yeah uh, were there any particular inspirations that st stood in your mind when you were first thinking about the game absolutely there was plenty of inspiration yeah. 
or or plenty of games that we 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 studied or we think oh that game it's awesome for this particular reason or this other game is awesome and i can mention a bunch of them uh for instance for the base stardew valley was one of our oh, references yeah. on creating an Beautiful idyllic game. or a place where you would like to leave right yes. and make your and make your little and make your little base there <laughs> and then when we're looking at, at at for instance another example for the missions right for the missions uh we looked at games such as uh rift breaker or diablo let's say so games that have a some type some kind of some kind of top-down approach that you fight enemies right and we have to we wanted to give our, of course our taste to that so it's it's not exactly the same way but if you ask me for inspirations i can give you a few there is more like the exploration of subnautica or other more indie games such as games that you may may not be heard of like like uh, Little Woods, for instance, yes. is a small game that that also you have to gather. And we want we like that game because the constant progression feeling is really satisfying. So we wanted to convey that feeling somehow onto our players as well. And I think you had a slide that shows the gameplay loop for us, right? Correct. So we'll cut if to we that. We can play this slide. Yes. Yeah, we'll, we'll cut to that right now on uh, Louis' screen. Actually, yeah, there we go. There it is. Everyone can see it now. Yeah. So it's the same that I explained, right? Yes. Uh, but here, here is much easier to understand. So Absolutely. you go to the combat missions and you get a bunch of loot, right? A bunch of resources yeah. and weapons. And then when you go back to the base, you can actually sell that. You can actually buy more. You can actually craft or evolve that what you got. You can mm. get researches. You can gather new resources. And then with that, you create more power. You can gear up better. And then when you gear up better, you can go back to, to more difficult missions. And that then the gameplay will reset. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great way to just easily explain it. And the cute cat at the top right of this uh, top left of this slide also. <laughs> Very important. Yeah, uh, yeah, there. Yes, Everywhere. There, there we go. Uh, and, and we have some uh, some footage of the game. We'll cut to that as well as we uh, talk about it. So the game has actually been released and it's in early access uh, and people are playing it and enjoying it. So can you tell us a little bit about how that reception and reaction to the game has been? Sure. First of all, uh, shout out to Alexander Pankov and Nurula Morshid, which yeah. are here down, appearing down the screen. there. <laughs> the Nurula is our lead QA, and, and Alex well, yes. is our our lead designer. They couldn't come to stream, but they asked if they could appear. So we found out that why not to Cameo. let them appear while playing while playing the game. So yes, so the game has been released for three months in early access now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we released back in December of last year. At the big, the game has been received mostly positive, most, mostly positively, uh, because at the very, very beginning on the, our early access, we had some annoying bugs, unfortunately, mm -hmm. that we couldn't find out until th thousands of people played the game, right? Mm -hmm. So, but then we find out, we fix them, and I believe, and since that moment onwards, the game has been very, very positive. Uh, the reception has been great, and I'm really happy Amazing. for it. Yes. So... Coming from there on, we have been releasing updates every two weeks, wow. although we plan to release updates, big updates every three months. We haven't yet released the first big update, which we plan is going to come very soon. I don't want to promise a date yet. We have a date in our development yeah. roadmap internal, but I'm not going to give a date here just in case. And we'll be so, answering so many questions in the chat, but that is the one question we will not be answering. So don't bother asking for the date. It's You're not, you're not going to get ready. it. But feel when free to ready. ask anything else exactly when it's ready. So it's a good answer. So I'm curious, you say there's big update and there's small updates. So mm. what do the small updates look like and what do you envision? For, for a big update i'm curious what is every two weeks is a it's quite a lot uh, that's great uh, like if you're part of the community to be getting something new every two weeks very exciting so i'm curious yeah sure so the small updates has most to do with requests of the community especially yeah. quality of life requests okay so i'm just going to put you an example here um with the key bindings, a lot of people like to, to do their own key bindings for the uh -huh. game because they, especially for the combat, you may want to be comfortable because it's quite fast paced. Um, so the left handed people, they we forgot or we didn't thought that it would be necessary to key bind the numpad keys. 
But if you are left-handed, most likely you would want to use those to have your skills and your and your rolling and stuff there because it's much easier when you play with your left hand on True. the mouse and then the right hand on the right side of this of the keyboard. That's right. We didn't do it, and then they ask us, "Hey, we want this," and it's like, "Yeah, sure. In two weeks, you got it made." Nice. So that was that was the idea, and we have been releasing quality of life, bug fixes, performance improvements, and a few small features on our on our updates. Very then nice. for the big updates. Mostly, it's expanding the story, the story, adding new features to the game, adding new biomes, new enemies, new weapons, and new bosses. Okay, so the and and we haven't done one uh, the, any of the big updates yet. Not yet. The first one will be coming. Okay, and have you teased the community as to what specifically is coming, or is that? Uh... Has that not been released yet? The teases have been really small so far, okay. but we will start soon to share, to disclose more information, actually starting on this streaming. Okay, I love it. I can't wait to see that. Um, so before we start jumping into all of that, uh, actually, no, let's jump in right away. We're going to look right at how the game is being built. We, we uh, Brian has some slides prepared for us for how the data-driven approach to building the game, right? So maybe you can give us a little bit about your history and how you came to this approach. Sure. Um, so before I was working on Cygnus Enterprises, I was working on uh, the Far Cry franchise at uh, Ubisoft Shanghai. And uh, I have to say Far Cry is not made in Unity, but uh, it's still a good example of making a very, very data-driven game. So there I was working on Far Cry 5, but at the same time also on Hours of Darkness, which was their Vietnam DLC and Lost on Mars, which was their Mars-based DLC. So all those three games were being developed at the same time, and they used a very clever way of swapping their asset databases, mm -hmm. which would then load a completely different set of game functionalities and data. So you would load the weapons, the characters, the objectives, as well as all the UI. And um, from a development point of view, saying it here at the bottom, all these nine games, they were made in the Dunya engine, with the same code base, of course, improved in every iteration, okay. the same database system. So it was a very efficient way of uh, developing their Far Cry series. And level designers and designers, they were able to create content by just uh, plugging in data either in the asset database or in the level editor directly. And I wanted to use this same kind of development approach for our game. I see. So they use that approach for multiple games. So why use it for one uh, single game? Um, so uh, if you can go to the next slide. Yeah. Um, I wanted to have all the um, tools available to designers and level designers without a need for programming assistance. Um, so all our, all our data is encapsulated in scriptable objects. And we extended the scriptable object system of Unity. Mm -hmm. uh, we call it conf config files, configuration files. Okay. Uh, they have unique reference ideas and they can be accessed through code and also to verify certain objects. And so our, our class structure in our code base is we have our config files, which are kind of like the mold, like the blueprints for our building blocks, which then create our data objects, which hold all the pure data. And then those data objects can be serialized, they can be saved, they can be loaded, mm -hmm. and they can be applied logics to in, in logic classes. And so, yeah, the, the reason why I wanted to use this approach is because we have um, a game with a lot of content, um, although it's kind of like a, a sandbox action RPG game, it's also it also has a long story with many combat missions, with many things that happen, like dialogues that pop up, cinematics that trigger uh, based on certain days and certain events. So I want to make a very flexible system for that. I see. So you're, it's just very forward thinking in that sense where you know more and more will be added. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, and something we noticed since, the, since week one of working on this game is in a top-down game, you have very limited vision. So in a first-person shooter or in a third-person game, you can rotate the camera in any way and see what's ahead of you to kind of find your way. But in a top-down game, you're limited to just what's on the screen. So you really you need a really good navigation system. So to give purpose to the player, uh, we made a quest system. And mm. this quest system has 45 different types of quest objectives. Wow. Um, and then each of these quest objectives, they have different subtypes. 
and we use uh, Odin plugins. So the moment we change one of these subtypes, the inspector window changes in run uh, in real time. And in this example, for example, you can see a quest objective being set up. And on the right, you see a quest which has all the objectives in it. And in the middle, you can see how it looks like in the game. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay, so you use that system. You're so th it's basically an extended version of the, or it's using the scriptable objects for the quest system. Yeah. So it's all um, built on on the same thing. Yeah. In fact, most of our systems um, they get store their data and scriptable objects. Right. Right. And um, to to make it uh, even more user friendly for the, the player, because if I if I just tell you, hey, uh, we'll go to this location or talk to this NPC in a top down game, you wouldn't know where they are. Yeah. So what we then do is we spawn quest marker targets based mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. your current quest objective, which you can see here in the middle. Yes. Um, and then we have an arrow indicator that points you to the closest objective. And we can either point to a specific object by giving a unique reference ID. So if you really need to go to a specific location, or we can just say, um, if you need to gather resources, for example, uh, highlight the, the closest mineral ores or highlight the closest building of this type or highlight a certain NPC because, you know, they can walk all, all over the place. Mm -hmm. They're not always static. Um, so, yeah, that's why we added this system. Wonderful. Okay. Um, so some of the core game systems that, that we made to support the player journey is the, the quest system to guide the player, the promotion system. Uh, so we have an in-game promotion system that gives the player overall goals. So in, in our game, the... The player is a contractor that works for this big corporation. Yeah. And he climbs the corporate ladder. And the first <laughs> promotion goal he has is to uh, repair this derelict base. Um, yeah. So the promotion system is used for overall goals. And the quest system is used for your next steps to achieve your overall goal. Then uh, we have a mission system uh, to give you guidance in the combat mission. We track telemetry, although we don't send it back, but we, we store telemetry on how many times the player has died, how many minerals they've gathered, and we feed that into the achievement system. So our game has many achievements as well to give extra incentive. Um, and all so, of these... So the yes, achievements sir. are based off of some of that data, like you've you've yeah. taken a thousand steps or you've gone to this location X many times or something like this, yeah? Okay. Exactly. Nice. Yeah. And uh, each of these systems, they're event and data-driven. Um, so they all use scriptable objects and config files and each of these events, they're able to trigger actions. Mm -hmm. um, and these actions can be defined in either data or code. And I'll, I'll tell a bit more about uh, actions in the next slide. Um, so we have two kinds of actions. We have action configs, uh, which are also scriptable objects. And they can, for example, trigger a dialogue or give an item to a player or trigger an animation or trigger a cinematic timeline. Uh, or we can trigger action logics and they're attached to actual objects in the scene. Uh, so an event could be a quest objective has been completed. Then this can trigger an action config, which is play a certain cinematic or play a dialogue. And then that action is triggered. Okay. So every, anything that can happen in the game can be triggered by any other system. And this can be done without the need for any coding. So any designer or level designer can trigger it. So the designers have access to this. And is it like in the inspector or is it like a node based tool you've built? How, how have you done it internally? Uh, it is in the inspector. Um, nice. So I'll, I'll show a bit more about that in the, in the next slide after oh, this great. one. So um, these events, they can be triggered by, you know, walking through a trigger, interacting with an object or NPC, completing a quest, uh, getting promoted or completing a mission. Yeah. And then on the next slide, if uh, you want to trigger it, for example, the moment a zone loads or the moment a player uh, walks through a trigger or even the moment an enemy walks through a trigger, you can attach this uh, component called uh, scriptable event logic, where you define how do you want to trigger this and then which actions do you want to trigger. And uh, this way, level designers, they can set up any action without the need for a code. This is wonderful. You know, this is a, it's kind of a parallel to last week. We actually spoke to the uh, Among Us VR developers. And they also wanted to make sure that their designers, uh, level designers and, and task designers had full access also using scriptable objects. But it's interesting to see the differences in the approach and the process 
to to give the designers that to empower them, right? Because I think it makes a huge difference. They're they're there for a reason. They're on your team for a reason. You want them to be able to you want to be able to enable them essentially to to actually yeah. do their work without constantly asking the programmers like, hey, I want this thing. Can you like implement it for me? It's like here are the tools. Go have fun in your own corner, right? Like that's yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. And um. Uh, one thing that we noticed, especially when deadlines were arri uh, arriving, is that everyone wanted to work on the same scene, so uh, the same uh, in-game scene. And we developed a scene lock tool, so um, you could lock a scene exclusively and then no one would be able to edit this scene until uh, you release it, so until it's been merged into, into Git, mm -hmm. it's been tested by QA. But this still created some issues because it became basically a rush for people to lock a scene as soon as possible and everyone needed to access a scene at the same time you know the days before the deadline narrative designers needed to add dialogues maybe uh, level designers or level artists they wanted to tweak a few things um, so in order for um, us to keep on adding logics and events uh, i made a system called event actions uh, so basically, you can target any scene okay. uh, with this scriptable object. And then you can say, hey, if this scene loads and uh, this uh, requirement has happened, then trigger this dialogue or then trigger this cinematic. So by mm -hmm. using this approach, we were able to make changes to scenes in terms of triggering actions without actually modifying the scenes. And this allowed us to not block each other's work. Wow, so that you're actually building the the game logic kind of outside of the scenes. It's kind of living, yeah. looking into the scene. Exactly. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah, because that's a that's an issue that comes up often. Multiple people, you make a you make a change to your scene. The other person makes a change, and then uh, merge conflict. <laughs> and then yeah. it's okay, you spend thirty minutes fixing that conflict, and you're just wasting so much time. So this way, I guess you don't ever deal with that. Yeah, exactly. You Wonderful. avoid that issue. Wonderful. Okay. That's a great that's a great idea. And was that the last slide or is this another uh yeah, that's the end for the, the data driven approach. Uh, something I'd also like to yeah. show you is um our level generation system. We made a video for this. Okay, wonderful. But first of all, I just want to say this is uh Absolutely incredible. And I guess the, the level generation, there's a lot to talk about there, right? Like that's going to be a whole. So we'll, we'll cut to that video now to the level generation. And you can walk us through how that's built. Can you tell us a little bit about just how levels work in your game for anybody who hasn't played it yet? Uh, sure. So we have um, two aspects of the game. Yeah. We have uh, the base camp where the player can uh, construct buildings. Mm -hmm. He can land visitor ships. These mm -hmm. uh, visitors they can be employed, you can give them jobs, and they will live on live in this base. Okay. They have their own little shelter, nice. um, or the, they stay at the dormitory. If they're visitors, they go to the canteen to eat. <laughs> and then you access the world map, and you go on a mission. And then uh, these missions are separate scenes. You fight with creatures, you complete certain objectives, mm -hmm. and then you receive rewards that you can use to craft new stuff at the base. And um, the, the base camp... So the base camp and uh, the base camp is made manually, um, but many of the missions they use this level generation tool. So we actually have two tools. We have one for the dungeons. And by the way, this is uh, exclusive footage. This is the upcoming uh, lava dungeon, oh, wow. which is coming in our DLC one. And using this tool, we can say how many rooms we want, how long we want the level to be, and then it generates a part and uh, it generates the creature spawning. Uh, so the level designers, they have a base layout. And then from here, they can manually edit it. So for the dungeons, um, it generates complete rooms which are connected to each other. Mm -hmm. And for outdoor levels, it combines the, um, the tiles to make um, a bigger environment. And, and these tiles, are they pre-made tiles that are then just like snap together randomly or is the mesh being generated in real time what is the level of of randomness i guess so in this case they are pre-made tiles so nice. we have a huge set of tiles okay and then based on what kind of tile they are if they're a corner tile or a connection tile then they will be used by the algorithm to to link it together okay so you have people on the team who are just pumping out one tile after the other and building yes like pieces of exactly the and then okay yeah. and how do you and how much of it is 
So there's the, the random like connections, but how much of it is designed? That's something that comes up a lot in the discourse of should your levels be procedural generated? How much procedural? How much hand handcrafted, hand designed? So I'm curious where you landed yeah. in that spectrum. So we have we have two kind of uh, missions. We have missions called story missions, and they get a lot of manual setup. Yeah. Uh, so they start from a generated map, but then they get like a custom touch, uh, custom editing from oh, nice. artists, from level designers. Then we also have random missions. And random missions, they're kind of not part of the story, but players play them to get extra loot. Nice. And they mainly use the procedurally generated uh, missions. But, That's um, a very interesting approach. We, we generate them uh, not in runtime. We generate them in advance. Uh, then a level designer will set up the objectives. It, he, they will make some tweaks. And then we play through them. And if we find them fun enough, then they will get added um to the pool of missions that are available okay so regardless you've seen all the like nobody will ever yeah. play through a randomly generated uh level that you haven't seen that the team hasn't seen correct i see i see so you won't just I have a bunch of dead to, ends <laughs> i want to bring some topic about this because Please. we have two different level generators we have okay. the in what we call indoor level generator yeah the indoor level generator is based on a room based algorithm Mm -hmm. So the rooms are pre-made and then the rooms are connected based on the, the, the nature of the room. And we set an objective and a path and basically the algorithm generates you the whole mission. But then, of course, you can trick it, but it's based, it's room based, whereas the outdoor missions is style based. Yeah. which means that the tiles are, as Brian said, you have corners, you have centers, you have um, you have borders, so you have all these kind of different tiles, and then the tiles are combined to create the level. Mm. Where so you have both. We have both level editors. We have the one that is uh, room based, which means that it's a combination of tiles that creates a room already, and you have then the pure tile base for the outdoor missions. So it can generate both missions, right? Both uh, the outdoor ones and the indoor ones, and they use different algorithms and different, of course, tools. Okay, and does an indoor mission ever open up to an outdoor? Do you ever like combine the two or? Uh, yes, in the DLC we have um, a mission that starts outdoor and then goes into an indoor mission. Okay, okay, spoilers. I'm just kidding. <laughs> more like more like exclusive sneak peek. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Uh, okay, so now that we've looked at this system, I think knowing this, it'd be great to now look at the actual. Uh, the gameplay and the different elements of the gameplay. And we have some videos prepared for that. And um, Oscar, I think you're going to walk us through a bit more uh, uh, about like development stories and the game itself. So uh, I think we'll go to um, the base video. Yeah, that, that's it right there, right? Yes. Perfect. So now we're just having, as Brian mentioned before, uh, you've been hired by Sickness Enterprises. Uh, to be one of their contractors at the beginning of the game, to be employed as the basically the recovery man for uh, an outpost that was lost a while ago for unknown reasons, and you you land in the planet and you start you start working. So you you basically create this base, right? And this base uh, in this game has basically many many features that unlocked during your player journey. You start with simple with a couple of buildings that allows you to basically craft and research. So you have your own crafting system that allows you to, to get uh, some resources that you can gather around the base and get them and transform them into something that you can actually use. Then also you have a research system that allows you to progress farther by spending some of these resources and, and getting better. Yeah. And also, as you can see here, now I'm... I'm, I'm I'm showing the base, the, the build mode. Yes. So of course you can customize your base as you would like to by spending resources and putting the buildings on the best place possible. Because in fact, there is a, uh, the placement of the buildings matters. Some buildings like to be next to others, whereas some other buildings dislike to be next to each other. For instance, you can see here, I'm pointing at the factory that is surrounded by warehouses and the science facility as well. And that boosts these buildings, which is really important to optimize your playthrough. If you want to get good, better, it's better to, to, to do this, uh, to do this uh, nexus. Okay. Then what is, this is, I think it's pretty cool. You're not alone in your base. You actually can, this base 
serves as what we like to call inside the studio uh, a, a sci-fi space station, a sci-fi gas station. So basically, people that is traveling around the around the universe can take a, a, a rest in your base. So they you can summon them to your base. You can you can call them by the landing pads, and then they will have a time of relaxing your base, and they can sleep in your base. They can buy stuff from you. They can eat on your facilities and many other amenities that you can actually build. This provides you with income, which of course is what your company, your boss likes. You, you, <laughs> they, want you, they want you to earn income from this base. This is actually your main purpose to be here. Uh, very interesting. And then you earn this income and actually you can spend those income on merchants that are also interested in coming to your base. So you can, nice. also, you can also bring merchants and you find more merchants along your player journey around the world map. So these merchants, you can exchange them for the credits. So you can you can pay them with the credits, and then you can get better gear as well. That of course you will use during the ma the missions that we will take a look later. So, and then there is many more things. For instance, the visitors you can yeah. actually hire them. Uh, so they bring to your base, they come to have a nice time, but actually you can tell them, hey. Do you want to stay with me and work for me? So you can actually hire them and they have different stats and their different jobs that are they're good at. And then you can put them to work on your facilities, to work on the base that you created. And then they will provide different bonuses and, and, and benefits to the buildings, to the production buildings that you have and the other amenities. Even you can bring them to expeditions. So you can, you can send them to missions uh, and then they can bring you different gear and depending wow. on what visitor, so what, what employee it's better at some missions or on others, then you can, you can actually train them by when they work, they get XP, right? They get better at, at it and then they level up and then they're much better at these missions. And these are systems that for now at this very moment are in their base nature, let's say. We plan to expand a <laughs> All lot. All of this of and it's still in its base nature, eh? I mean, yes, I, you're cool, essentially cool. building a society at this point. I love it. I love how you described it. Uh, you're sending people out to get stuff for you. And it seems extremely deep. And to hear that this is just the base version of it is uh, really exciting, I think, for your community. Yes, I think so. Well, I hope so too. In fact, I believe that after taking a look at this base, we can take a look at what do you do with all these resources? So we can take a look at uh, one of the missions that we have created. Um, so if we could play the live stream video, I think that it would be really nice to, to show what is all this about, right? Because I, we can see here that we're feeding, we're feeding our employees and our visitors with different foods that we craft. But if we can play the other video, uh, back to the original uh, footage of the game. Yeah, the live stream video, the the video of one of the missions that we prepared. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Is it this one here? Is it this one? The one or... No, one we... of the missions. So one of the missions that we prepare is called live stream mission. Oh, okay. It's a, it's a combat right. mission. It's one so where you fight. Is it this one? Great. Yeah, I see. Well, this, yes, this, this works. There we go. Yeah, there you go. This this works. So, okay, this is actually, uh, again, spoilers alert, this is one of the last missions of the game at this very moment. Of course, there's going to be many more, Yes. but this one will serve me to explain a few more features that the game has. Um, the game at this very moment has six different classes that you can make your character. Uh, these classes uh, feature different skill sets and different kind of gameplays. We decided to make it omni class, which means that you can actually change class any moment. Like you can actually combine classes, and there is synergies to be found between classes. And also, the different gear would also adapt to your gameplay. So, in here, we are on one of these indoor missions that Brian explained, and we're fighting against some of the anomalies that you find on your stone storyline i don't really want to go on to why there is this kind of enemies but indeed there is kind of a big problem in the universe that you're meant to you're trapped in the middle of and you have to you have to kind of help fix okay we won't spoil everything here we'll keep some things a surprise yeah <laughs> Great. And actually, Lewis will talk later about the AI of these of these creatures because it's fairly interesting. Wonderful. But the the game at this very moment features around well, a lot of skills, maybe around sixty skills. Wow. Uh, there there is twenty four active skills and a bunch of passive skills that you can use uh, to your advantage. In here, as you can see, I'm using I have equipped four of them, 
and I have two weapons that I'm using. The weapons are different. One is more like single target uh, long range, whereas the other one is more like a shotgun that spreads bullets. So I would use them in different times. Like for instance, if I'm fighting against a bunch of enemies, I may prefer to use my skill number one with the weapon number two, and then basically time the rolls that I have to make sure that I, I dodge the projectiles. Because I have to say that this mission is fairly challenging. It looks it. very difficult. Whoever is playing right now is uh, very impressive. It <laughs> it's, was. It was. It's me. It's it was me. you. Okay, look at you. <laughs> first, it, first try, by the way. There you go. Uh, no, okay, nice. No, I'm kidding. It wasn't the first try. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, yeah, so so you're playing different skills, and actually, yeah. in this, for instance, mission, we can also see uh, some of the systems that Brian made shining, uh, the the quest system and the different action triggers happening uh, when I'm basically here collecting some of the activators that I need in order to get to the boss fight, which is going to happen in about 45 seconds, more or okay. less. So another thing that we were really interested in is in creating dynamics between the enemies. So if you can see, each of the enemies has a set of mechanics, right? Some of them, for instance, shields other enemies, which nudges you to kill one of the enemies before the others, because otherwise you won't be able to fight the rest of the enemies. We also have enemies that shoot from long range, whereas others try to come closer to you by teleporting. All these kind of dynamics generate in the player certain movement paths yeah. and this is what what creates fun in my opinion okay. the fact of limiting the space and making and making the player move in a certain or force the player to move in a certain way and this is the culmination of it um this is one of our cutscenes where it's basically your well something is happening i don't again i don't want to spoil the story fair, fair enough. but but you're trying to to fights against this this threat that it's that it's uh, cursing your base and of course uh, drilling your profits and you can't accept that because of course you need to keep on earning money for for, money. for your base and here we can see the boss uh, that we will have to fight against there is of course a, a name and a purpose for this boss and this is at this very moment in my opinion one of the most challenging fights we have in the game okay um, and it will definitely bring to the best of you. Of course, there is better skill sets that will allow you to have this upper upper hand onto the boss. Mm -hmm. There are some some builds that are more viable than others, whereas all of them are viable. Of course, all of them have been thoroughly tested, but I find, for instance, some of them being easier than others, maybe because of my gameplay. But in here, it's also really interesting to see the different patterns of the boss uh, that you have to fight against. Right. And it's really, really important to time them, so to time your your skills and your dodges correctly if you plan to survive to this mission. I probably have to say that I defeated it the first try without any issue. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, you gotta drop in the humble brag, you know? <laughs> it's, I love it's, it. it's, it's, it's not true. I spent two hours and it's the sixth try, but, but you can cut that from the stream again. Yeah, Just possible. gigabytes of recordings of you attempting the <laughs> you know, terabytes. But, but, I, but yeah. I succeeded and it felt great. I mean, Wonderful. of course, I played it many times and Brian will show how this boss looks like when we fairly started developing and you will yeah. see the huge difference but well yeah, that just yeah. goes to show the replayability of the game even the developers are you know have to do it over and over again to get to the to the end and that you know everyone likes a yeah. nice challenging game something that's also pretty fun is yeah. that uh, we often watch uh, youtubers so players that upload their playthrough and especially when they reach this boss um, they can put on their super serious face and uh, play full focus and either die horribly or uh, survive. And watching that. have the best reaction when they survive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Watching that is pretty funny. And oh, sometimes we even discover sometimes, new, yeah. new tactics. Like yeah. um, even the other day, someone was playing a medic security mixed build. So it was a very tanky character that was able to uh, heal himself. And you see these big attacks with the arms. He was yeah. able to just tank it and heal himself uh, back to full. Um, so yeah, based on the based on the builds that you play, you get access to different abilities. And for example, in this this video, Oscar is playing pilot. Uh, that class is very squishy. It has a lot of move movability, 
mm -hmm. uh, mobility. But if you get hit, you take a, a big <laughs> yeah. hit. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you can lose uh, big chunks of your health in a few hits. Amazing. I have, I have a few questions that have come up from the chat and myself. Just looking at this scene and even the base building, everything looks extremely beautiful. Beautiful shaders, uh, amazing systems. I'm just wondering, and people in the chat are asking what uh, render pipeline you used and uh, you know things like these reflections, the lighting, what kind of lighting you used. If, uh, maybe you can talk to us a bit about the graphics. Uh, it's sure. really eye-catching. Uh, yeah. So we, we do use uh, HDRP, so oh, artificial wonderful. render pipeline. Okay. And uh, many of our, uh, well, most of the shaders are custom shaders that we made. Okay. And and use and the reflections. Is there anything uh, out the box HDRP that we were using? Uh, that I would need to check with the artists. But uh, there is there is actually we're yeah. using we're using standard post processing profiles and yes. we're using shader graph to make our own shaders. But at the end of the day, it's based on the available technology. Uh, so there is not there is not much much shader let's say code just i mean of course there's a lot of coding with the shaders but mm -hmm. but most of the tools are just interpretation of the tools that you already have right with the yes. hdrp yes. and the and the the shader graph uh then post-processing profiles are really useful of course and just uh, just use it just placing placing for instance as you can see here some emissive materials you can see some bloom you can see some uh some Bog. You can see some vignette, for instance, a Beautiful little bit reflection of as well. Yes. Yeah. So, so most of these kind of things are can can be found on standard post processing profiles of Unity. Amazing. Uh, and then another question from the chat uh, from the Aya asking, I'm curious what the process and this is this goes back to something you brought up way earlier uh, about this two week updates and then the bigger updates. And it's a uh, great question. Uh, what your process and workflow is for doing big updates alongside small updates. So how are you? You know, you may have sprints for smaller updates, but then there's this big, bigger looming yeah. thing. How do you manage that? So we have um, different branches. So we have a branch for uh, all the DLC content. Um, so all the stuff that's happening in the big update goes to that branch. Yeah. And then we also have dev patches. So dev patch one to to six. At the moment we're at dev patch six, mm -hmm. and there we fix quality of life improvements and bug fixes. So the way we work is well, we work on on Git. Everyone, when they make it, when they do a new feature or a task, they create their own branch. Once the branch, or once they, they finish their feature, um, we do a merge request. So other programmers review their changes, and then a QA a person will test that branch and see if there's any bugs or issues with it. And then if they approve it, it gets merged into into the main, uh, you know, main line and then it's it gets ready to be pushed to steam okay. and um, so we we're actually constantly so um uh Nurula, our our qa developer um he made a system that constantly uploads builds to our private steam branches so we're making builds automatically all the time and uh, it's it's really handy to test the game as to always have an updated version Oh, so every day, every morning you come in, there's a build from the previous day. Uh, multiple oh. times per day, there's multiple new builds. Being... Yeah, yeah. There we go. Do you have like a build machine in the office that's just yes, there yes, just we to do. build? Okay. Yes, we do. W wonderful. Okay, that's great. Um, in fact, uh, now, that get... you, now that you mentioned this, in fact, now that you mentioned this, so we have yeah. a plan, like a roadmap, and we normally plan in six, uh, six sprints time. So basically each six sprints, it's what we call a release or a patch, as yeah. Brian said. Yeah. And then it's split into two weeks time, right? These two weeks times normally include uh, a lot of work on the patch that we are working on and a bit of work uh, that is basically pulled from the player base. Right. And that bit of work that comes every two weeks is the one that we release at small updates. Whereas the big chunk of work, it's planned beforehand uh, for like, let's say six sprints or 12 weeks of work. So that's how we combine both things. I see. In and terms then, of planning. And do you have people like team members who are like on both, working on both, or do you try to keep it separate? Like you're on the longer sprint, you're on the shorter sprint, or is, is there a crossover? Yeah. They're they're in both they're in both, both yeah. and because because actually Brian can explain this better but normally our developers are centered on their own features so if their feature mm -hmm. has a queue a quality of life improvement that it has been requested they will take care of it as well as the features like they're 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 part of the feature that that uh, requires to be further developed for the big update oh I see so there is a bit of context switching 
that happens. And I feel I feel that's usually a challenge. Uh, we don't usually go into this in, in this spotlight, so I think this is actually a very interesting topic. Just like daily workflow, uh, as a as a programmer, like or anyone on the team, when you have context switching, I'm just curious how you handle that. Do you tackle you know those two tasks within the same day, or do you allocate different days in the week to the different tasks? What do you find is the best workflow for for context switching? That's a that's a good idea. But uh, so I. Normally, we have standard processes on how to work on tasks, mm -hmm. right? And we have we have also uh, a limited amount of time, which is normally two weeks, right? Yeah. The yeah. tasks are planned before the sprint. So when yeah. you start, you will you already know that okay, I'm gonna have to do these tasks, these two tasks that are gonna go are gonna go on the small update, yeah. and and then these three tasks that actually are gonna go onto the patch one. So so it's not gonna be live that soon, let's say, right? So you already know from the get-go, so from the start of the sprint. So then you can plan yourself however you prefer. It doesn't really matter as long as it's finished by the end of the two weeks. So about content switching, so you mean you have to change branch, but changing branch in Git, in Git is not that... Let's oh, say, I actually meant good. like mental and like work-wise context switching when you're jumping yeah, from yeah. one thing to another within your day. I can, I can answer this question. Yeah. So um, in the way we structured our programming team, everyone is um, a feature owner. Mm -hmm. So everyone is specialized to a specific thing. Like, uh, for example, Lewis is specialized on all the AI of all the creatures. So he will handle all the all the creature AI, all the setup for that. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, a programmer called Kirillo. He handles all the combat systems. So he made a very advanced weapon system, which is node-based, where you can set up the weapons, the projectiles, how much damage they deal. Um, so everything weapon related, he will handle. Um, so it's a very clear division who owns what system. And um, this way, it's not so difficult for people to, to switch because all the systems that they work on are essentially their systems. Okay, I see. So it's something they're already on top of. So there's the switch becomes less of an issue. Got it? Yeah, exactly. That, that's good to know. Uh, they've, they've gone past that starting friction, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, great. Uh, so I think we've come to the last section of the stream, or uh, I guess before last, uh, which is the AI systems. Uh, Louis, you've been awfully quiet. It's time for you let's to shine. <laughs> and, and, and All right, let's uh, let's dive the into the engine. engine. Yes, absolutely. We're going to actually dive in the engine live now. So we'll cut to Louis' screen, and we're going to be looking at uh, early animation uh, prototypes, navigation, some new weapons that are coming in the DLC, and then uh, some spatial hashing. So uh, where do you want to start, Louis? Uh, well, I can start with uh, with the pathfinding uh, navigation uh, that we did. Oh, so I think, uh, as you may know, you know, in uh, Unity, you have like NavMesh, uh, NavMesh agent, so mm -hmm. for pathfinding. And it, it works great, but uh, in our case, uh, we kind of needed to have like some custom navigation, custom pathfinding, because maybe in terms of gameplay, uh, when enemies are moving, uh, in our case, we have like cute creatures that unfortunately need to kill them. But well, uh, they, they still need to have some information about the map, like maybe they need to destroy a building, maybe they need to do something. And with Navish Agent, we couldn't really like have all this custom information uh, in the in the navigation so we've been using something that uh, that is called flow field so if i unpause the game i'm gonna explain what it is so basically uh flow field it's like a, a grid uh where each uh, each cell of this grid is a is a direction that you need to follow to reach a destination so let me just um show it because it might make more sense okay so this is a playground uh it's basically a scene where we can uh for, for designers, for programmers, we can debug stuff. So, yeah, so right now what you're seeing is um, is a navigation um, data. So we have, um, okay, let me, uh, like you see this grid, uh, each creature uh, is just looking at uh, at the grid where it is, the cell, and then it, ne it knows that it needs to go in that direction. Yeah. So like if I'm moving, for example, you can see uh, some arrows that are pointing to me. And basically, this is our navigation data. So why did we do this? And why aren't we uh, using NavMesh? Well, the reason is that uh, at one point, we wanted to have a lot of creatures. And uh, if we use the NavMesh and we calculate path manually, it can become super expensive. Uh, let's say you have a, a 100 agents, then you're going to have like frame drops because it's taking too much CPU times. 
And the cool thing with our navigation system is that all these creatures right now, these two, they're all using the same data. Okay. So for, for one destination, in our case, it's reaching the player. Each creature uh, just shares the same data. So we just bake one grid per destination. And uh, baking a grid can be quite expensive, but in our game, we kind of only have one destination, which is a player or maybe a building or something else. I see. So it's not a problem. Like they all share the same, the same data. So it works, uh, it works really well for RTS uh, games. But in our case, since it's just following the player, it works, uh, it works perfectly. And the cool thing with this is that we're using uh, jobs. So uh, you may have, I mean, people may have heard about uh, Unity jobs. Yes. So it's a way where you can actually uh, run code uh, on, on workers' uh, threads. So your code is running in the background, basically. Right. Uh, so yeah, it's, like, it's not blocking the main thread because you know, Unity is single thread. So it's not gonna, they're gonna block all your, your logic uh, running. And the, the even best thing is that uh, Unity has a Burst compiler. Mm -hmm. So Burst, uh, basically, it takes your C-sharp code and you just add uh, an attribute uh, on top of your class and boom, it's, uh, it turns into native code. So it's, uh, it's super fast, like okay. it's blazing fast. And uh, well, I mean, I guess I can try to show it here. So just so to show how like uh, powerful it is here. Oh, I was just gonna say, yeah, so you have tasks running in parallel, plus yep. the plus the burst. Uh, so the threading yeah, yeah. and the so burst like is helping with optimization. Yeah, so it's like getting all the squeezing, yeah. all, all the performance we can. That's perfect. So if yeah. I uh, if I enable this, uh, let's do it live. It's gonna be a first. Let me spawn a few enemies. Uh, okay. Love seeing God mode. <laughs> okay. There we go. Uh, so if I go somewhere, let me put this here. Okay. So we can see uh, here we have our jobs. So somewhere inside is actually, um, wait, let me check a frame. Okay. Background jobs. So somewhere I should be able to see my, um, my jobs running. I can't find them, unfortunately. It might happen too fast. Uh, uh, need to move a bit. Up, oh, I'm getting hit. Well, of course, when it's live, it doesn't work. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, wait, that's that's odd. Well, okay, uh, I, I have some pictures that I I, I, will, I might be able to share you later. Have some pictures on hand. But, okay, great. Yeah. yeah, but um, basically, let me uh, let me grab the picture. Uh, yeah. So. See, uh, chat, if you have any questions, uh, please throw them our way. Uh, we'll be taking questions throughout. Okay, so basically, um, we there went we from, uh, like, this is, uh, so well this is uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> this is a view of, uh, of the jobs, uh, of the, of the jobs in the, in the yeah. Unity profiler. So you can see, like, all of these are uh, different threads, right? So uh, in, in the flow feed calculation, there are three phases, and uh, some phases can, um, can be like fully multi-threaded. So like you can see here, you have a lot of stuff running at the same time. Then there's another phase that run out take five milliseconds that cannot be multi-threaded. And then you have another phase that can be multi-threaded. And then just by adding um, this cute attribute burst compile, we went from like five milliseconds uh, here to 0 0.15 milliseconds. And all this was just by uh, using Burst Compiler and basically turning your C-sharp code into, uh, into native code. Oh, wow. So, uh, okay. yeah, so it's like a, a huge improvement because uh, like most of the time when you're doing this kind of AI computation or like highly, you know, CPU intensive operation, being, you're really limited by C-sharp speed. Uh, but by being able to just, uh, just use native like Burst and have native speed, it's, uh, it's a game changer. And did you find, uh, did you build the game at first? Before doing burst, and then did you see the performance difference? Yeah, did you so, feel it well, right away? Yeah, like I mean, the thing is, when you use burst, you have mm. some, um, you actually have some limitation in terms of uh, how how you're coding, how you are like structuring your code. Basically, you have to follow some convention, so you yeah. only have like structs type, uh, native array, this kind of of things. So, so first thing is like we we usually do do a quick prototype in plain C sharp, and then if we see that like it, it gives a good result, we just uh, 
we just make a, a more like robust version, but we have to think that it's going to be turned into burst. So yeah, like you, when you're writing your code from the beginning, it's better to directly use, you know, structs and this kind of, uh, of, uh, I mean, following this kind of, um, requirement rather than having to change your entire code base later when you realize, oh, it's too slow. Perfect. I see. So doing things early so that you're not yeah, going yeah, back yeah. and forth. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, definitely. Yes. Uh, was there a video you wanted us to play on our end to match this? Or? Uh, well, uh, no. I mean, like uh, I can. Uh, well, I can go to um, to a level and let's uh, let's check a bit of footage. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna oh, kill them all. <laughs> Are you gonna release that weapon? They killed them all. Text. Uh, <laughs> yeah. to the audience. Is that is that that's, a tease? That's how Are that's how I do the boss. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good for speed runs. <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> okay, so here am I in the first mission. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so all these cute enemies now, as you can see soon, yeah, like they all share the same path uh, yes. and they all follow me. And you can you can see that some of the on the grid we have some some cells that don't have a direction. Yeah. And it's actually a, a, an optimization that we did. I mean, it's uh, actually quite famous, but. Uh, when a creature has a direct line of sight to uh, to its destination, you actually don't need pathfinding. So it's like an early exit, early optimization. Oh, I see. Uh, okay, so when, when there's no direction, you can just go to target. You don't need to do pathfinding. So you can save uh, safe cost. I see. Uh, yeah. When you have a line of sight. That makes a lot of uh, sense. Another thing is, yeah, so we have a kind of swar enemy swarms. Um, most of the time when you have swarming, flocking, this kind of stuff, you need to have nearest neighbors, right? So you have one enemies, and then it needs to know what is uh, around him. Yeah. So me, we we actually made a, a quick system for this. Um, I look for this. Okay. Yeah. So we're using a uh, special hashing. It's a really simple technique, where uh, like the naive way to look for your enemies is like basically okay I'm unit one and I'm gonna loop through all the units of the level and then if it's within a radius okay it's a neighbor if not it's not mm -hmm. but like if you have a hundred enemies then it's hundred times a hundred it's just not doable mm -hmm. so in order to do this uh, we can put all the enemies in a grid so you can see like here you have three uh, three cells and then if I'm in this grid right here I just need to check that grid and that grid I mean the, the grids that are around me. So this way you can actually, instead of checking on the entire level here uh, for all the enemies, we know uh, really easily um, how, to, uh, how to get the neighbors for enemies. And it's used uh, in the flocking because um, when, uh, when enemies are moving, they're going to they're gonna need to avoid each other. They're going to need to maybe stay together or all this kind of stuff. So yeah, it was also, we had a, a lot of issues in the beginning. And uh, we were using um, like, in Unity, you have a uh, sphere uh, overlaps this kind of special query, but it's yeah. relying on the physics engine. So it was a bit heavy. Uh, so you opted to, like, not to use it, the sphere yeah, overlap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, it's uh, basically, it's uh, it's also using uh, jobs and burst because like, I mean, I really like uh, burst. It's It makes uh, things fast. Yes. So uh, we have jobs where you have, um, it's a hash map basically. Uh, each grid is uh, is a position hash, and then uh, you have a list of units in this in this grid. I know, yeah, it works in real time. It's also uh, using jobs, so um, so yeah, it was a, a cool thing to do. Okay, and and so so this is one type of AI we've been looking at. I remember earlier, uh, Oscar, you teased a different type of AI that has a special behavior. Is that right? Uh, that's in the final boss of almost when you're almost at the final boss. There's a special AI. <laughs> Well, it's not that it's a special AI. It's just mm -hmm. that it uses most of the systems. It has made by it's, been, it's made by Louis, so Louis yeah. can actually explain a little bit Ex more exactly. about it. Yeah. But oh, wait, are, are you talking about the, the anomalies and, uh, yes. and the buzz that we have? Yeah. All okay. Right. So we have uh, we actually have two different kind of enemies yes. uh, that are. So we have this kind of uh, quadruped uh, creatures. Uh, for example, this is a charger. It's like a cute uh, piggy-like um, creature. <laughs> And these creatures actually are uh, using root motion for animation. Oh God, so, is cute. like, yeah. I mean, why <laughs> would you want you have to, to kill, kill them right? all? <laughs> well, they're, they're I mean, for profit, we'll, we'll do anything, right? 
reason. <laughs> yep. Could I get this? Climb money? that corporate ladder. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we have this kind of uh, mammal creature uh, that are like uh, have like really uh, highly uh, detailed animation with oh, but motion. Wh but why would you do this? If you know you're gonna make us kill so many of them, why would you make them so cute? <laughs> it's it's corporate greed. <laughs> Like, the more I look at it, I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> There's a reason your camera's so far away, because you knew if the camera was close, <laughs> nobody would get anywhere. And they <laughs> yeah, I know, especially the, what, what, was, what I was saying, we have really high, high like, really little. polished animation. You can see yeah. the little ear twitch Yeah, it's here. amazing. Uh, but yeah, like, you gotta yeah. get resources, and uh, and that's what you have, right? So, yeah, so yeah we have these uh, creatures, uh, and we also have um, anomalies, so um, which are kind of more like from another dimension robotic kind of thing mm -hmm. and yeah this is what oscar was saying so in in dungeon you're gonna have these these enemies uh and they're done a bit different because they're not using root motion uh mm -hmm. they have really simple animation and mm -hmm. um they actually uh like they hover in the air they're not walking so it's done differently but i i wanted to talk about the the creature more yeah. Because the creatures are using root motion. And uh, yeah, so as I said, like they have really a realistic animation and they look good. But root motion is kind of tricky. It means that in your animation, uh, your animation is actually moving your object. So when you have AI, uh, it's it's almost like if you have a car and you need to make an air for a car, which means it can only turn by a certain degree. Like you have a turn radius, you have a yeah. speed limit, you have all this stuff. That's when you move a, a swarm, you have to take into account that, yeah, this guy can only turn by maybe, I don't know, like 180 degrees per, per second. So yep. I, can, I cannot turn it too much and you have to make it realistic. So the way we did this is uh, in UT, you have blend trees. I think uh, in Mechanim, everyone is familiar with blend trees. Yes. So this is like uh, how it looks in idle. And we have two parameters, basically the speed and the direction. Can so, I actually just quickly, uh, for anybody who doesn't know what blend trees are, I want to give it just a quick uh, intro. It's essentially weighting the animation between two animations, right? So you could have like a straight walk and a tilt, and your blend tree can blend between moving straight and moving to the right. And so you'll get an animation that's somewhere in between those two, right? Yep. Yeah. So yep. Just for Perfect explanation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah. So as you said, uh, for example, turning, uh, you can see that the animation is actually turning my, uh, my object. Uh, and then moving, I can just like make it move just by changing the, the weight, the blend weight. There you go. So yeah, uh, and then um, yeah, we need to uh, like we have the, the navigation. Uh, basically, you have a desired uh, this velocity, and uh, we feed this uh, this uh, animation information to the system, and then it gives us the actual uh, blend weight, uh, the correct blend weights that we need to set to the animation. So you kind of have a feedback loop between the AI saying, I want to go that way, but then the animation is like, but actually I'm going this way. So mm -hmm. you need to, uh, it's a bit tricky uh, to make both, uh, both working together. Yeah. Right. But yeah, like the way it's done is like the, the navigation system controls uh, the animation, uh, the animation uh, blend weights. Okay. So and the, the, I, this, the flow, that kind of flow map is speaking to this in a sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, I think I had some footage of uh, early animation. Uh, yes, like uh, we'll play C1. that. So, so I think this is the the early animation. So that would be uh, B six on our end. We'll play that. There we go. Yeah. So you can see here. Uh, this was the beginning, and so animators wanted to go full root motion, which is cool, but uh, they didn't made uh, they didn't make uh, turning animation. So you can see how they just slide turn. And it just looks terrible. Mm. So like when uh, when See when enemy is stopped, it's just like turning on himself, like it's got it with no actual yeah, yeah, yeah to yeah, the yeah, body, yeah. just this, just a, a magic turn, yeah. Yeah. So Sliding. so it, it, this is one uh, one thing is like if you go for in our in our like um, situation for something really realistic, you need to have a lot of animation. So we actually right. had to request a lot of animation, like turn animation. And you can you cannot try to make something realistic if you just have like a walk cycle and a run cycle. And you have a you have a, like a dedicated animator on the team of I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we okay. have uh, we have uh, a few animators and uh, nice. and they can tweak everything. Uh, have like a really good uh, a really good workflow for animation. But yeah, it requires a lot of animation supports. 
Yes, absolutely. Okay, and and it, it was the navigation movement? Was that an example with the final movement? Is that video an example with the final movement? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, we'll, you we'll play that know. one. Yeah, the one right after E7. There we go. So, so this is basically the the end result of our swarms. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, one thing uh, I wanted to say is we don't really have collision uh, between players and enemies, and okay. even enemies themselves they don't have like let's say physical unity collisions. So in the in the physics engine, the layer the, the enemy layer is not colliding with the enemy layer, and the enemy layer is not colliding with the player layer. And the reason is we want to be able to control who is pushing who, and by how much you're pushing things. Oh. Because one thing you will realize in Unity is like when you're using character controller, a lot of people are complaining, hey, how do I push things? Or oh, I'm getting pushed outside of the world, I'm getting yes. out of bounds and this kind of stuff. Yeah. So uh, one way, the way like we we solve the problem is with using uh, spring forces. So spring forces, it's a simple, uh, it's like basically simulating how springs will behave uh, together. Yeah. So when it's getting closer, it's like squeeze and then it expands. Okay. And, and, and do you, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go. I was just going to ask, uh, does it change depending on what type of enemy? So if it's a much yeah, bigger yeah, so enemy, the there's a, yeah. Yeah, so we can we can say that okay, uh, the player is only able to push like for example, it's a swarm, so you don't want to get stuck in the middle because no. it will be super annoying. Yeah. So you're still able to like uh, walk through, but if you have a huge monster, you can definitely not push him. So we have a total control over collisions uh, by doing him by doing it uh, ourselves. That's great. Yeah, I see, I see that. There's a that's important. We have lots of different enemies. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah, many enemies at, on at one time <laughs> on screen. Okay. And and yeah, the last thing is for enemies, uh, we're also not using character controllers. Uh, so the way we're actually moving them, it's, it's, a, it's a hack, it's a trick. So they all have a nav mesh agent. And as I said, we're not using nav mesh, but we're using the agent as a character controller. So uh, maybe if we can go back to my screen, I can, uh, I can show something. Yeah, we'll go back to uh, Louis' screen now. There we go. Okay, so as you see, there, there is indeed a nav mesh on this on this map, but this nav mesh is just used as a as a representation, a simplified representation of the level. So instead of having a character controller like and colliding with colliders, we're just using this nav mesh, and then uh, creatures they have an agent, and we just set their velocity based on uh, our custom uh, navigation system. Mm -hmm. So if I spawn, um, if I spawn. Uh, Another one of these cute charger. Yeah, um, where is he? The, this guy actually um, has a has a nav mesh agent. He's not using the nav mesh uh, path, like we don't need to compute it. But he has indeed um, a nav mesh agent uh, which is somewhere. Okay. And yeah, and so the, the reason we're doing this is that uh, this way, because sometimes level designers are going to put a bunch of colliders or like you're never going to have like a super clean map. And just by having this uh, representation, this simplified representation of the world, uh, we can make sure that uh, everything everything stays inside the world. It's not going like, to collide with weird thing. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, yeah, it's, it's super uh, light in terms of performance. So we realize that, for example, having 100 character controllers is kind of heavy. But having a hundred uh, agent is not that heavy. I see. Okay, so you opted for that approach. You were you tested yeah, yeah, yeah. both, and you saw which was taking more memory. And, yeah, and yeah. Okay, great. Oh, actually, there's another optimization question from the chat. Uh, it's it was related to the other scene, I think, where they they asked. Um, I saw that some of the grass moves in some areas, but not in others. I'm guessing that was for optimization. Are you spawning particles over those parts of the grass, or is that shader magic? <laughs> So, uh, no, I didn't do the grass, but uh, as far as I know, it's, uh, it's just, it's, um, we have some compute shaders uh, that does uh, the grass movement, and then there's supposed to be a LOD system, so that's why it wouldn't move maybe far away, and it's moving, uh, n like, near the player. Okay. But done. it's all done through a, a compute shader. So we have yes. some, uh, some impact, uh, grass impact system. Uh, uh, using render texture, so when the player is moving, it's actually drawing in a texture, and then uh, we're using this texture to to move the grass. Okay, okay. Uh, and then there's another question from the same person. It's uh, Alex Leon Leonard uh, Ria. Uh, what are you using for the grouping patterns of enemies? 
Uh, so we're using uh, basic steering behaviors, I would say, plus uh, a bit of custom code. Mm -hmm. But uh, it all started from voids, basically. Oh, sorry, from uh, what, sorry? From voids. Uh, I don't know oh. if, you, if you heard about it. It's a, it's a three simple force uh, that are used uh, for flocking. So oh. it comes from, um, I forgot his name, I think it's Craig Reynolds. Uh, and he was looking at, at how birds uh, were flocking together. And then he just like, he was like, oh, okay, I know how to do it. So this is a formula essentially that this person yeah, it's developed. A, it's a, yeah, it's a super simple formula. It's okay. a, like basic vector math. You have like avoidance, separation and cohesion. Okay. And actually I can show it here. And and the, the, just to highlight why this is important is if you don't do this, you'll just have the enemies all running into each other, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Since they're not gonna have each other, they're gonna be stuck, and uh, yeah, it's not gonna yeah. be great. So yeah, we have uh, some of uh, here some of the settings. So you can see a bunch of different weights. Uh, it's all the, the parameters that we use in, in the flocking. So you have like alignment, which means they're gonna go in the same direction. You have cohesion, which means by how much do they stay together or they can form other groups. You have separation, uh, kind of try to uh, enemies for, uh, avoid uh, each other, and then uh, a bunch of other things uh, that we use uh, for, for the flocking. Okay, got it. Um, yeah, that's very insightful, honestly, because I think that's something a lot of people struggle with when they, when they want to make these kinds of games where they have lots of enemies attacking the player. Yeah. It just doesn't feel as fun when the enemies are, all seem kind of dumb. I guess that's the best way to put it. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, actually, you don't really... Here's the thing. Uh, if you have a good visual representation of your, of your swarm, you don't actually need a super smart AI. Yeah. Because in our game, it can even turn into some kind of bullet hell where, like, Basically, I, I shoot everything that come at me and I just want something satisfying, you know, like yes, killing 10 yes. meters a second. But just the way they move, if it feels satisfying, it's 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 uh, it's fine enough. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, and then I think there was uh, one more thing we were going to look at, which was a tease at some upcoming content, maybe? Uh, maybe On your end, the new Oscar, weapons? Uh, can, um, okay, so we'll play that footage of some of the new weapons and Oscar, maybe you can uh, talk about this. Yes, there is two more things that I think that it would be really nice to show. One is the weapons, and then we can show... Because I'm worried that people will be discouraged by the fact that we're showing quite complex stuff. But that's not how we started, right? That's a so good point. So we have a really cool video to yeah. show that our humble beginnings. Yes. But, but this video, it's pretty cool because this is unseen... So these weapons are not in game at this very moment. When we started designing the weapons, I have to say that we were a bit, let's say, conservative. We, we went for the typical approach of what weapons could, could do, right? Uh, in terms of more realistic approach. But then the more you, the more you develop, the more you design, the more you want to go creative and wild. And, yeah. and then you start making, okay, what if we have a bullet that explodes and then explodes further and then release, release tracing bullets? And, you know, and then you start going over your head and we're starting to create a lot of, let's say, crazy weapons. Yeah. And and every weapon that you, you get in the game is more crazy than the one before. <laughs> and but they're awesome. I mean, of course, they have to be useful. Don't get me wrong. You're still fighting enemies that are not that are quite serious business. But but you will see that um, well we expect that in the next update people will have to will be able to find weapons that much better suit their playstyle mm -hmm. and they will have a share bit of fun trying out a lot of weapons with amazing behaviors, or that's what we expect. Here we have a P90, I believe, or a P90. Uh, not, not exactly, but how it would be 70,000 years in the future. Nice. That's how we imagine it. So it's a P90,000. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Again, Luis, when, when Luis recording these videos, he always likes to use pigs. We have more threatening enemies, but he prefers right. this one. He likes whatever to kill reason. them. Yeah. You can ask, you can ask Luis. <laughs> they were the first one to be in game, so that's why. <laughs> they have a special place in my heart. <laughs> but definitely we have we have a lot of plenty cool weapons. And actually uh, here, shout out to Chen Xi, which is uh, the designer that takes care of the weapons. Uh, and he has ba he's basically doing uh, I don't know a lot of explanation on on what we could do with weapons and different damage types because we, there is different damage types that are related to different kinds of uh, gameplays like for instance poison or then you have more explosive so weapons cool. that are are more AOE. Uh, and do these stats exist like the fire like is that something that's already can things already be lit on fire or is this each time you want to design a new weapon you you're now introducing new effects like. Yeah, enemy exactly. ability effects, yeah. 
Exactly. So when we started these, we set the rules of the game, let's say. Uh, we set the rules of what would be done, and then you need to bend those rules to try to encapsulate stuff like that. Mm. So we have a few, let's say, uh, damage types, mm. like physical, we call it like, we have kinetic, we have energy, we have poison, yeah. we have fire, if I'm not wrong, and perhaps I'm missing one, types of damage. Mm -hmm. Of course, that means that you have the same types of resistance. It means that you have kinetic resistance, physical resistance, uh, um, fire resistance, and poison resistance. And creatures have, of, of course, their, their stats according to their resistance, depending on, on the, this kind of damage type. The same as weapons will have different damages depending on the type of the weapon. Right. And it's, it's the, the duty of the player to try to uh, game it out to find the best weapon in every in in the best mission according to their let's say their trial and error or what is weak to what mm -hmm. i see okay and actually uh, I'm, I'm really curious as to the process of brainstorming to what we're looking at now for a weapon so does it start with an artist making a mock-up like a pre-visualization or is it uh, mostly prototype. You're shooting cubes first, and then you're adding the effects. What's the what is that uh, process? Okay, so a bit of everything. Okay. Um, we have some weapons that first comes the weapon, and then comes the weapon design, mm -hmm. and then we have others that is the opposite. It's like, okay, I need a taser. I need a small weapon. Uh, actually, I have to say that we have three different kinds of, at this very moment, there is uh, three different kinds of factions, which are basically weapon manufacturers in the game. Because Cygnus is not the only company in the world or in, in our universe, there is other companies. There is FTU, which is Free Trade Union. We have also uh, Maze, which is another company. And each company are basically weapon suppliers. And each company has different uh, vision on what weapons they would potentially supply in this universe with Cygnus being much more energy like and more clean approaches so more clean clean and, and direct designs another uh, for instance mace being much more shotgun and fire and yeah, and yeah. more aggressive weapon yeah so based on that vision and based on the stats allowed then you can start you know bending the rules okay what if there is a bullet inside the bullet what if there is an a bullet that explodes and then creates other explosions and then you start bending the rules to create all these weapons but again the so you have the weapon and then you have the projectile yes. and these are a combination and perhaps brian can actually explain how the system works within it because then you don't really need the the programmer anymore to generate all these gameplays the bullets have a behavior system uh, that is actually, I, if I'm not wrong, based on a, on a on a visual programming system. So you can yeah. create different different bullets, and then you can uh, attach events to the bullets, and then you can, uh, let's say, link bullets to bullets, or or do different things within the bullet, and also creating animation at the start, animation at the end, VFX at the start, VFX at the end, yeah. and you can visually program that to create whatever uh, f uh, whatever gameplay or weapon behavior you would like to what do you think brian about this uh yeah you explained it perfectly oh. so um in in this case uh kirillo made a node-based system so imagine uh, your your config files but you can open them up in a node-based editor similar mm -hmm. to to blueprint That's so and cool. then you connect them to each other and uh, for every node you can set the parameters this way you can create really creative weapons and creative uh okay bullet types i want that one the one we just saw the one that <laughs> is like you shoot that ball that just shoots hundreds of bullets in all directions that's fantastic yeah um maybe we can show the um, the sickness evolution video so yes you can absolutely. see the the evolution of the the game over time uh, absolutely so yeah now that, now that we have an idea of how much work went into the game let's see where it started uh, take it away <laughs> Yeah, so uh, back in September 2020, this was Humble the beginnings. very yes. first uh, combat prototype. Then uh, we made a, a demo. And as you can see here, here we're not using root, root motion yet on the characters. So they, they look a bit like they're sliding. And then mm. later, once, once we got our demo approved, we moved away from here. So you can see here that the UI is completely different from what we have now. And then here, uh, once we got approved, once our project got approved, uh, we started from scratch. We started making all our animations 
uh, using root motion. And this, by the way, is the first prototype of the boss fight. You know, the, the hypercube uh, with the, the tentacles. This is the first version, literally just oh, rotating, wow. I love it. rotating cubes that the player has to dodge. <laughs> And then uh, when we didn't have uh, <laughs> <That's too good. laughs> models or animations yet, uh, we put together a bunch of cubes and they're animated using basic mathematics, not even animations. Yes. Um, and then this was like um, an updated version of the boss. It's not, not the current version, but uh, version looks, before looks that. looks great, yeah. And, but it had um, problems with the lightning, as you can see here. Still, there was a lot of shites, uh, like shines uh, that flaring impact, in the yeah, camera. Yeah, would have impact the, the character. So we kind of had to reduce the the spectacularity of the scene because otherwise I, it was not gameplay. Pro it was not good. Yeah, game. I think. Yeah, we yeah. did a lot of iterations on many systems. Um, like here, you can see this version was quite heavy on the post processing, maybe a bit too heavy, and uh, also with uh, quite strong camera shakes. Um, but yeah, we, we built up the game over the years and then we played it, we iterated on it. And then this is um, one year before release. So we yeah. have our own uh, cast, uh, custom character creator. And this is like the, the super basic version of it. So there was only one character available and uh, with one hairstyle and you could change the hair color and then deploy in the game. Um, all with placeholder uh, UI. Okay. And then uh, we kept iterating on it. And this is Mission Zero. And um, yeah. This was the first mission that we actually did, did custom wise. And, and it's kind of the first one that we say, okay, I think that we got it. I think that we got what, what kind of like, you know, the, everything kind of aligned together. It's like, okay, this grass looks awesome. This mm -hmm. uh, vegetation looks awesome. The rocks look good. I think we got it. This is this is it, and and then we expanded from there on. So I remember remember uh, when we did Mission Zero, I was like, okay, that's like, awesome. That looks fantastic. I think that's how it is. And then you're always leveling up, and then you look back at what you had before, and you're like, no, yeah, <laughs> yeah. How, how did I think that looked story. amazing, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is some footage of the demo. So the current uh, current version. Uh, so also for a bit of advertising for players who want to try our game uh, for free, if you go to the Steam page, you can play this demo. Uh, yeah, which is around I think forty-five to one, forty-five minutes to one hour of uh, gameplay. So it's very generous. I think uh, everyone should do that. And then combat missions and the game. also the the base gameplay. So um, the the demo doesn't start exactly at the start of the game. So we skip the introduction levels and we put you in a point where uh, you're just about to unlock build mode so you, you can experience all the features of the game. Without Get right having... into it. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And we'll drop a link to the Steam page in the chat right now, actually, so that uh, you can jump right to the page. Uh, definitely check out the game. Yeah. And then, so we're not right now we're in December, 2022. When this thing started, it said 2020. I thought we were still in 2020. I'm, I'm, I'm shocked. <laughs> no, man, I was going back. Yeah. Yeah, but to see how it's changed, just things as simple as the grass, um, like obviously from here, it's a, it's a massive difference. And, and, and this is something I think is is really great for people watching to see and we've we've looked at a few evolution vi videos or like previous prototypes for other games and you know it really does always start with a couple of unity blocks or some capsules or yeah. something like that and really puts things into perspective that like you want to get into game dev and you see all these beautiful games and it just can seem so overwhelming but you just need to take it like a step at a time right and you'll eventually yeah. get there start with some some cubes make it fun with cubes <laughs> uh before we uh, end these streams, I usually like to get uh, final takeaways. You know, it's a long journey to, to build an entire game, to reach this point that you've reached. So you must have uh, faced so many challenges and learned so many things. So just one piece of advice or a final takeaway you have for, for aspiring game developers or even experienced game developers, whatever uh, advice you have, uh, we'll do one each, uh, starting with uh, Brian. All right. right. Yeah. Um, so my advice would be... Um, don't give up and keep iterating. So um, your, your, your game will get better over time. First, focus purely on, on the gameplay. Uh, don't lose yourself too much on the graphics. And then once your gameplay is right, then you can iterate and improve until you feel that it's right. 
I, th- I like that. That's good. Okay. Thanks for that. And then uh, Oscar. Actually, I'm going to go in a different approach than Brian. Okay. Okay. Uh, know when to stop iterating. Oh, uh, interesting. <laughs> okay. I, I found myself also in other projects uh, getting down the hole and not being able to finish up the product. Right? Yeah. So sometimes if you, 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 you give yourself an objective and a scope and once you get better at it, you will realize that what you have done is not good enough or that you want to change it. Okay. But this is because it's you. But the people that would play it would find it awesome because it's the first time they've seen it. That's true. So, so don't worry if you realize that your product is not well enough. It's not well enough for you and will never be. Yeah. But for the rest of the people, they may be able to appreciate your art already. So release it out there, get feedback from the people, and most mm-hmm. likely you will be surprised by the result. You will realize that, hey, they're liking it more than I thought or that I expected. Okay. So yes, release, finish up projects. Uh, I see. That's a... That's very good advice. So, so basically, uh, don't be afraid to iterate, as Brian was saying, to get to where you need to be, but also know when to stop and when to put it in people's hands at, yeah. a, certain, at a certain point. That's great. That's a good, some good balance there. That's why you see, that's why you guys work together. <laughs> and then, and then uh, last but not least, uh, Louis, please. For me, I'd say if you're a single developer, like not a huge company, don't go for something too realistic. Because in terms of uh, art, uh, it's much easy to forgive some bad animation if you have something that is funny looking, uh, maybe like you know some tune shading or whatever. But if you start to go to a realistic into a realistic direction, uh, you're gonna need a lot of assets, a lot of art, mm. and then if you have one thing that doesn't look right, it's just gonna break everything. So yeah, maybe going for some cartoony things, uh, simple things, funny looking. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point, especially if you have a small team. Yeah. Otherwise, it's going to be so much work. Okay, that, that's also fantastic advice. Basically, a lot of advice to help you actually finish your game, to get to, to, get to an end result at, at a certain point, because that's why we do this. We want to put it in people's hands and we want them to play the game. Uh, guys, thank you so much. This was really fun, really amazing. I'm so honored to have you as our uh, first team coming uh, from uh, Shanghai. Uh, we, we did a lot of work to make sure we could get this set up with the with the distance and the connections, but I think everything was super smooth. So I'm super happy everybody got to get got to see your game, got to see behind the scenes for the first time. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on so early uh, in your day, and you took a lot of time to prepare all these videos for us. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. Thank you yeah. so much, Hassan. Um, so Thanks for you. having us. Thank you, and thank you to the entire chat. Chat, please stick around. We'll raid another Unity. Uh, developer now uh, so uh, support uh, the unity community all right thanks everyone we'll see you thank see you guys you GDC next thanks. week bye 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 see Ciao. you there bye bye <laughs> welcome to sickness enterprises contractor we are the galaxy's leading space exploration mega corporation you have been tasked to restore our facilities on Mytilus to a productive and profitable state. Now, let's get to work. <laughs>